the stack Nakamoto release is basically kind of going to do three things. So firstly, it's going to make the blocks much faster. Then secondly, like the, the blocks are also going to get much more secure. Then the third and final thing is Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Bitcoin Builders Breakdown. This is our show talking about everything that's happening in the Bitcoin economy with builders, with developers, and breaking it down piece by piece so that you know what's happening and where to get started if you're looking to build in the Bitcoin economy. I'm your host, Kyle Ellicott, and today I'm joined by one of the well-known builders in the Bitcoin economy. If you don't know, Tycho, welcome quick intro for the few that might not know you. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to, uh, it's great to meet everybody. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm Psycho and I'm a uh, co-founder of Zest Protocol. I think we're recently building on-chain Bitcoin lending markets and, um, and yeah, for Zest Protocol or also while building Zest Protocol, I, uh, I was also general manager at, at Trust Machines where, you know, made a lot of you know, exciting contributions to, to the Bitcoin economy as well as, uh, as well as the stack there. Right on. And Tyga, talking about the stacks layer and, and some of those contributions, you and I have had plenty of conversations about this, but let's inform the rest of the, the world about stacks and the big upgrade that's coming, which is called Nakamoto, the Nakamoto release. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about what stacks is. Uh, we've talked a little bit about it be, being a Bitcoin L2 or a layer two, but really what is stacks and how does that relate to the Nakamoto release? Yeah, so essentially, like Stacks is a programmer layer that exists to you know, actually you know, make make Bitcoin programmable. Um, now, what's out there today in terms of you know what you what you can program is there is a uh, an independent blockchain right that derives its security from from Bitcoin, right? Um, but you know it's quite slow. It's maybe not as secure as we'd like, right? And you can't move like BTC. The assets, you know, on, on on top of it, right? And that's you know, that's all going to change with the with, with the Nakamoto upgrade. So it's very much going to, you know, going from kind of you know a proof of concept, which is what we have now, to kind of you know the full the full thing. And so Stacks mainnet came out in January 2021. Fast forward, the Nakamoto release will come out end of 2023, maybe early 2024. With that, what is that release going to bring? Uh, that is an improvement upon the mainnet launch uh, just a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the Stacks Nakamoto release is basically like it's basically kind of going to do three things. Um, so, firstly, it's going to make the blocks much faster. So, currently, Stacks blocks are anchored to Bitcoin blocks, so you'd be waiting like ten to twenty minutes, you know, every time for for a new block, right? Which Kind of slow if your the state of your app depends on on, on the stacks chain, right? Um, and much slower than you know we're used to today from Ethereum or even Solana, right? So this is going to go to five seconds or less than five seconds, right? So that's like a that's a huge improvement. Yeah. Um, then secondly, like the the blocks are also going to get much more secure, right? Or it's basically going to get much more secure to build apps on on the stacks layer. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I can sort of dive into the details there, but essentially, like for a stack block, the security budget is kind of going to increase by by five thousand times, right? And then periodically, essentially, all of stack state will become equivalent to Bitcoin security, right? So where you basically have to go back and change Bitcoin to be able to change change stacks. Yeah, that's that's sort of very very difficult. And then the third and final thing is is SVTC, right? That will be used in the Nakamoto release, which will basically allow people to move. BTC from L1 onto the stacks layer in, in a non-custodial way, right? Sort of in a similar experience to moving ETH from, you know, ETH L1 to Arbitrum. Wow. So let's let's rewind that for just a second. Transaction time. So right now, uh, you mentioned 10 to 20 minutes. We've heard uh, much higher than that, up to 60 minutes in some cases. Because again, as you oh, said, yeah. it's, it's, it's related to the Bitcoin-based transactions. So what does it mean to bring transaction speeds? And maybe if you have some of the technicals, how are those transaction speeds being brought down from you know 10 minutes, 60 minutes, all the way down to five seconds? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, essentially, like you know, th today, basically, it's only possible to create kind of a full stacks block, right, for, for a Bitcoin block. And, and essentially, how that's changing is that, you know, it will be possible for there to be many different stacks blocks, right, between two Bitcoin blocks, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, and essentially those, you know, stacked blocks will sort of, you know, be able to prove that they've happened, you know, after each other uh, in between two specific, specific Bitcoin blocks, right? So that means that, you know, if I send, you know, if I send you some stable coins on, on, on the stacks layer, right, then they can be confirmed, you know, on stacks before they, you know, are actually written down into Bitcoin and sort of, you know, being fully, fully, fully sort of, you know, uh, uh, ossified in a way. And you mentioned a uh, term security budget. I've heard this mentioned multiple times in articles and on spaces and just out in the, the Xverse or Twitterverse, uh, as we want to put it out there. Uh, what is the security budget uh, when it comes to Bitcoin L1 or layer one, the Bitcoin core network? What does that mean as importance to the upgrade for Nakamoto? But just in general, what is the security budget when it comes to Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, in general, like the, I guess if you think about blockchains, right? Like blockchains are, people use them because they are sort of, you know, they're provably more secure than sort of centralized databases, right? Where someone can just kind of come in and, you know, change something. So the sort of security budget of a, of a blockchain is essentially, uh, you know, you can sort of think of it as like, how expensive is it to go and in as a single actor and kind of change the blockchain right? and kind of mess with the state, mess with the database, right? Um, and essentially in Bitcoin, that would be, you know, uh, more than 51 or more than 50 or essentially 51% of, of the hash rates, right? Which in hash rate is basically, you know, all the Bitcoin mining computers, right? Like doing all these, all these, all these hashes to kind of, you know, create, create a new Bitcoin block. So you need to basically, you know, be able to spend like energy to generate, you know, more than 50% of the hash rate, right? So then, you know, then you can calculate how much energy would that be, right? And let's say Bitcoin uses as much energy as a small country like Austria, then, you know, it's kind of half the energy that Austria consumes in a day is kind of what's needed to, you know, it's a security budget for Bitcoin. Right? Um, so that's sort of how I can, can, can think of it in that way. And then, you know, the same goes for, for other layers or other programming chains like like, like Stacks, right? They they have an, an, an independent security budget, right? Uh, uh, whose aim is to be as closely tied to Bitcoin as possible. And actually over time, they will become the same the same as Bitcoin, um, um, but yeah, it's very important to sort of think about that when you're building an application to actually sort of you know understand like how how secure it is. With these types of upgrades uh, and improvements coming to a Bitcoin L2 like Stacks, what does the significance of this mean for the Bitcoin economy and maybe just broader Web three industry? Yeah, I mean, I guess what what we what we've seen so far, right, in this kind of Web3 or crypto landscape, right? Is that basically you have Bitcoin and it draws in a lot of people and, you know, they think it's interesting and, you know, they think it's digital gold and, you know, immutable and, and stuff like that. And then there's kind of all this action of like decentralized application building and, uh, and uh, you know, all this, all this kind of stuff, which basically has traditionally happened outside of Bitcoin, right? It's like, you know, Ethereum kind of, you know, kicked that off in a really big way and there's like all kinds of other chains that are built on Ethereum or that's sort of phasing better than that, right? And that's where all the, the programming action is sort of going on. And, you know, with something like the Nakamoto release, right, but also like many more people kind of expressing interest now in, in building on, on, on Bitcoin. Um, what you get is basically you get that all that developer and builder and creative activities kind of you know, coming back to, you know, where it all started um, and, and can sort of leverage the sort of most secure, you know, base layer in, in this, in this ecosystem, right. Which is, which is Bitcoin. And and I think that's um, yeah that's a very sort of you know, very relevant uh, uh, kind of trajectory and very relevant development I guess that's that's happening uh, you know through which we can uh, yeah we could actually you know, create more more good in the world. Well, and, and leading Zest Protocol, what does this mean for yourself and other DeFi protocols, decentralized finance protocols uh, as well? Yeah, I mean you know. If, Actually, the bit the prehistory of Zest Protocol is that we, you know, we started working on some early, early versions of, of Zest Protocol while, uh, while, at, while at Trust Machines, right? Um, and um, you know, Monique, the founder of Saks, is the CEO of Trust Machines, right? And we were kind of chatting and, you know, kind of we're like, look, this is like extremely difficult to do, and I think we won't be able to create like an app that sort of comes to the, you know, the level of of, of experience that 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 our users really expect, unless we. We, we, we changed something to, to the stacks layer, right? And, and that was kind of what, you know, kicked off this kind of discussion of like, hey, how do you actually, you know, make DeFi on Bitcoin possible? And, you know, what would you need to do to the stack layer, you know, to, to really make, make that happen? So, you know, sat down with Moneed and you know, core engineers and, 
you know, then creative energy started flowing and that sort of, you know, in the end led to SVPC and kind of the, the, the Nakamoto release design and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, in terms of like the main problem that we faced with the first version of this protocol is that it's very difficult to move like PTT, right, from from the Bitcoin layer to 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 the Stacks layer to actually be able to program it there, right? And if you make that interface easier, then it becomes much more easy to do what we do, right? Which is essentially um, you know, providing lending uh, services for for BTC, right? So basically making it possible for people to earn you know, interest right, or yields on their on their BTC and to and to borrow against it. So um, so yeah, essentially like. You know, it's it's uh, it's extremely necessary for us to you know, be able to serve users. Yeah, and 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 with that said, I mean, looking at everything outside of the Nakamoto release, what current problems do you see existing for those that may be new to developing uh, within the Bitcoin economy? A uh, lot of new infrastructure still coming into play. We've got uh, layer twos, we've got new protocols, we've got layer threes. We've got bridging coming from all directions, but what are some of those core problems that still exist that could inspire developers to start building, but also be aware of when they come in to get started in this uh, new emerging ecosystem? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically we sort of get to, you know, define everything again from scratch. And right? so that means that there's a lot of primitives to be built, right? Even from, I mean, you know, this, this year we've seen a big boom in Bitcoin wallets, for example, right? I mean, it's almost unimaginable. Like when we did the first version of Zest Protocol, we still had to use a Bitcoin wallet from, you know, 20, 2012, 2013, right? And, and that still looks the same. And so, you know, there we've made, made big progress, right? But you can sort of think in that kind of, kind of direction, right? Like core primitives, like you get the opportunity to basically build like some of the most fundamental and foundational foundational things, right? That 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 you know can be the most impactful things you do in your, your entire career, right? So that's what what one thing I think is very very interesting. Now the other thing is it it, it will be difficult, right? And like you know we it's, it's definitely difficult because you know if you if you go and build on an, an, an application on, on on top of Ethereum or Ethereum L2, right? You can you can take other people's smart contracts, right? You can like use all these dev tools that are out there. You can kind of you know smash everything together, use all these APIs. So it's all very sort of you know easy to or not necessarily easy, but like there's a lot of things that have been done that you can kind of take and you know put together and, and build on. Whereas here you have to do a lot of things, you know, your, yourself and for a lot of things where you know you would have APIs in Ethereum and so on, like you don't have them here. But that's also an opportunity, right? Because that basically means that if you can do something in this kind of scrappy landscape and you can get something out there that, that people use. Then you know it's quite difficult for someone to just come in and like you know have the same app as you in, in the next the next day, right? Which is something that's very common in, in in other in other chains. So you know in that way, it's like yeah, to sum it up, there's like a you know really big opportunity here to to build some some defining stuff, right? And um, and yeah, when you do it, like you will you will have quite quite a bit of a head start over over anyone that will come late. Just throw out just a little bit more inspiration. If there was one particular thing that you could have built and inspire those developers and builders listening uh, in the Bitcoin economy, what is that one thing and or category uh, that you would love to see developed over the next 12 months? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, I'm obviously biased, but I would love to see more more Bitcoin finance applications, right? And then you know, some people call it Bitcoin DeFi, but you know, you can also just call it like on-chain Bitcoin finance, right? Like, do Bitcoin finance where where it's supposed to be, which is on 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 on, on the blockchain, right? Kind of makes sense. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, we we've seen over last year, right, in twenty twenty two, like you know, that there were a lot of you know great sort of downfalls in this in this space, and you know, they all have one thing in common, which is that they were you know centralized centralized actors where essentially you know people got a bit ahead of themselves, right? Which is basically, uh, or were outright frauds, but in some cases they kind of got a bit ahead of themselves. Um, and, um, and yeah, like that's this technology, you know, exists so that, that can't happen, right. Or that, that, that won't have to happen. So, you know, that created a big sort of, you know, explosion, but you know, that, that creates sort of fertile ground to, 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 to do new, new, exciting, exciting things specifically in Bitcoin finance, right. Cause it basically barely, barely exists at this point. So, um, yeah, lots of opportunity there. And at the time of this, uh, recording as well, we've got over half a, trillion dollars of Bitcoin uh, sitting there uh, dormant, ready to be utilized in some way, shape, or form. 
uh, as well. And Tycho, last question, where can everyone go to learn more about you, Zest Protocol, get started in working or even reaching out uh, to get advice on building within the Bitcoin economy? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm personally, uh, uh, obviously on, on, on Twitter, I'm like Tycho.BTC, so T-Y-C-H-O dot BTC. Um, and, um, um, but yeah, like if you want to learn more about, about, about Zest Protocol, right, and essentially about putting your, putting your BTC to, to work for you, then, um, yeah, just head to zprotocol.com and we're essentially taking, uh, people in for, for early access to, 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 to the app. So we kind of have a little kind of wait list going on, but, um, um, but yeah, essentially giving, giving enthusiastic people about making Bitcoin productive at first quick look under uh, behind the scenes of, uh, of what's going on and how we, uh, how we built the new primitives for the Bitcoin economy. Right on. Well, Tycho, thank you very much for joining this episode of the Bitcoin Builders Breakdown. Uh, super excited to have you. And also for those uh, who are tuning in, make sure to follow and check out uh, Tycho on Twitter, but also uh, Zest Protocol as well. Until next time, everyone take care. Thanks, Tycho.